Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am delighted to have another episode of The Switch here. Uh, today, uh, Chase is not here, so Alex is substituting, pretending to be Chase, and I am here substituting for Alex, pretending to be Alex. So, uh, and this is a special episode for me because my friend Rupali Sharma is here and she's going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, uh, Montessori. So take it away, Alex. Thanks, Shrikant. We usually like to start with a quote. So today is from Albert Einstein. Education is what remains after one has forgotten what one learned in school. And with that, I want to welcome Rupali to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much, Alex. So that's a very interesting quote um, that you just mentioned. Education is what remains after one has forgotten what one learned in school. And Maria Montessori, when she talks about education, her whole idea is that education is for life. Mm -hmm. So everything that's done in a Montessori classroom is preparing a child for living independently, living purposefully, and uh, you know, not just learning things by rote, but by making sense of what's going on around them. So uh, it really um, rings true, you know, that education is not about just learning facts, not just about going to school and attending the classes for a test, but really what you learn um, and what you internalize to use in everyday living, whether it's your analytical skills, whether it's critical skills, artistic skills, you know, how you conduct yourself as a moral human being. So all of that is encompassed in the Montessori method. So a child who goes through the Montessori system really comes out as a wholesome individual. And I think, you know, uh, that education then becomes a purposeful activity in the child's journey. So I want to get into kind of how you discovered Montessori. So maybe you could bring us, tell, you, tell us a little bit about your story and where you were before and how you discovered Montessori and how that's brought you up to where you are now. Sure. So I'll start with a little story about my sister. Uh, I was in kindergarten and my sister was interviewing for preschool at my school. And the teacher gave her a set of knobbed cylinders and it was on a wooden block. The block had circles, uh, notches of different diameters and different heights. And she had these uh, cylinders in front of her. And my sister's job was to find the cylinders to go into each of these 10 slots. And my sister tried one by one. And, you know, I've, I had done that material several times myself in the classroom. So I was so eager to jump in and help her because I knew where she was making a mistake. But the teacher just... Um, very patiently would ask me to hold back and, you know, with a very gentle smile, just sit back. And um, eventually I saw my sister complete that activity and match each and every cylinder of different height and different diameter in the perfect order that it was meant to be. And she was just so thrilled. Um, and I still remember that day. I remember my sister's smile of satisfaction. And of course, back then I knew nothing about Montessori. I was just doing this because uh, my parents sent me to the school. And when we would go home and people would ask about which school we went to, my mom would always say, oh, they're going to the Montessori school. Uh, and they would say it in Marathi, which is our uh, language in India that we speak. And she would just say, oh, the Montessori la zali and I always thought that, you know, Montessori was uh, an Indian word. And um, many years after that, uh, uh, my son was born and we were in the US and I was in a public library. And in the public library sale, I found the Montessori handbook. And I was just so um, intrigued. I said, oh, I know this word. I've always heard my mom talk about it. And so I opened the book and of course there were all the materials that I had worked on in my preschool and I remembered them. Uh, and I brought them 
uh, ho I brought the book home and then I talked to Srikanth and Srikanth had also just started working with his niece on Montessori materials. And I was like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that Montessori was an Italian woman. I thought it was an Indian word. But um, her influence in India was huge. Uh, she was in India for a large amount of time and she developed her elementary program uh, in India. So, uh, you know, many schools in India, many preschools in India, uh, in the 60s and 70s were Montessori schools. So that's my first step into Montessori as a child, uh, trying out the materials myself. And I'll also share, you know, I'm still connected to my kindergarten teacher in India. And uh, when I teach, I refer to her and ask her questions. So it's wonderful to be able to stay in touch uh, with, you know, teachers, from 30, 40 years ago. Um, now, uh, when I started uh, working with Srikanth and started doing Montessori at home with my son and uh, Srikanth's niece, uh, I discovered that you know every day we would give these children um, some activity from the handbook, uh, whether it was a practical life or sensorial. You know, children learn through their senses. You see young children put things in their mouth, they touch, they, um, they, they lift, they like to carry heavy things, and they are just determined to just get something done. And so I could see everything that Maria Montessori was talking in her book, I could see it manifest in what I was watching in my son and uh, my friend's daughter just unfold every day. And they love to work and you know what I found was they were not tired of working. They were just joyful. They were so happy and they, they asked for more and they just soaked in everything that we gave them. So I thought, okay, this is, you know, this really uh, works for children. The system really understands how children uh, develop. And so that's how I uh, got back into Montessori after many years as an adult. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I had never heard of it growing up, and and that's interesting in different parts of the world that is much more ingrained in the society and, and accepted. Um, so, did your um, son experience other types of education, and did you have something you were comparing that to, or was it pretty much solely Montessori as he grew up? So, when he was in uh, preschool, because we had done Montessori at home. And we had seen the results of how well it worked for my son. We, we decided to send him to a Montessori school. But then in elementary, we did look at other options and then decided again that Montessori was the best method for him because um, even in the elementary years, Montessori is focused on the multi-age group where there's a mentoring, a peer mentoring um, I would say um, attitude or uh, philosophy there where children learn from each other and not just from the teacher. There's uh, a lot of exploration. There's a lot of experimentation that um, helps a child kind of figure out things for themselves and to think for themselves. So uh, during the elementary years, we did have him in, the, in a Montessori school. In the middle school, he did go to a, um, private school, uh, but it had a traditional uh, liberal arts program. And uh, then in high school, he went to a STEM-based uh, public high school where he uh, was again involved in hands-on learning. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. The the I, I like what you said at the beginning of the story you told, where you were really letting her pursue something for herself. And do you think part of the reason that Montessori works so well is because in a, a lot of the traditional education system, there's too much an emphasis on helping or uh, guiding, whereas like kids have a natural inclination to want to become an adult and to learn and to emulate behavior and navigate the world. Is that something you think is too much of an emphasis on the helping? You know, as... Um... 
adults, as parents, as teachers, as caregivers, we are, you know, all cultures in the world uh, train mothers and fathers to do for the child, right? Uh, as even as teachers, the idea is I'm going to impart knowledge. Whereas Montessori just changed the paradigm. She said, okay, here is a child who wants to figure out things for themselves. They, they, they want to touch the bread. They want to, um, you know, stack things up. They want to figure out what the limits are before something collapses or before I get into trouble. And she allowed for that ex experimentation. She allowed for children to explore, to go to those boundaries and then come back and feel um, contained and satisfied. So I, I agree with you that, you know, in the traditional system, uh, we still, although a lot of traditional schools are moving towards hands-on work, the, the framework still is teacher-oriented, teacher-centered, whereas Montessori is more child-directed, you know, so, uh, or child-centered and directed by the teacher. Mm -hmm. How does it evolve as you go into higher levels of school? For example, Montessori school for somebody in high school, is that a thing? Yes, there are, there are a few, quite a few Montessori high schools. Um, and uh, now Maria Montessori herself did not uh, design the entire curriculum for the high school as well as she developed for the preschool years and the elementary years. So uh, in the middle school and the high school years, her idea was that of um, apprenticeship and to work on a farm. So she called them the farm schools. One of the things she believed was that by middle school uh, age, children know how to read, they know how to write, they know how to do their uh, basic math. So in the middle school years, it's about applying these uh, skills to the real world. But, you know, their brain is not developed to completely understand the world and completely take on uh, the responsibilities of the world. So she creates these microcosms where they have a farm school or they have uh, some trade that the children learn. And uh, whether they run a business, whether they uh, do community service, but it's a larger project that where they are serving and um, not out of pity, not out of sympathy, but to take their skills and be useful to the community that they are in. So in middle school and in high school, that's the focus, the, you know, looking outward, looking at the world and using the world as a classroom and not just the four classroom walls. So it's project-based, um, multi-age classrooms, uh, some of the Montessori schools are also international baccalaureate program. Uh, so it's, an, it's a complementary program because the values are similar. Uh, and the focus is on hands-on project-based learning. The focus is also on becoming a global citizen. So that's how the Montessori uh, middle school and high schools have evolved. Uh, let's look at... Uh, the three to six year time frame, which is what Montessori focused on most of mm -hmm. her work. Um, and let's look at her philosophy of what a child is. How is her philosophy of what a child is different from the generally held view or the, held, the view held by most schools? So Montessori, the very uh, big element of Montessori education is that the child is an individual. So it's not just another little member of the household or not just an insignificant part of the community, but this child is an individual. This child deserves respect as an individual. And to understand that every child comes with a potential that needs to be nurtured so that this potential will then blossom into a creative, purposeful human being uh, is very different from the way uh, education has always been looked at for these young children. Most of the time, if you see uh, traditional systems use that age group as a babysitting or a daycare 
environment. And yes, they are cared for for their physical needs. They're cared for for their uh, nutrition and, you know, uh, those needs. But then what about the intellect? That's the age when the brain is growing at a very, very fast rate. And so what do you provide to the intellect while also helping them develop at their, uh, their, their pace for their physical development or social or emotional development? I think that's a different perspective that Montessori takes from traditional schools. Uh, thanks. So what you're saying is that the child, Montessori holds that the child is kind of driven inside out in the sense that it is an independent being mm -hmm. who is curious and wants to do things. Uh, so if that is true, then what is the function of teacher uh, in the Montessori system? How, what does the teacher do uh, for such right. a child? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a very good question because in most Montessori schools, uh, the teacher is actually known as the guide or a coach. The role of the teacher is more uh, that of a coach than as of teaching. So in Montessori schools, the lessons are often given as a three-part uh, lesson. It's called the three-period lesson. And the first period is just the gift from the teacher. There are no expectations, no assumptions, but just, you know, here is an idea, here is a concept. Uh, and the idea is to go from whole to parts. So the child gets to be in awe with that idea, with that central concept. And then the teacher, based on the teacher's observation, will create uh, activities for the child, uh, choose from a variety of Montessori materials for the child to explore that idea on their own. That's the second period. So the second period is that of repetition and just exploration. And through those exploration while talking to to other children, uh, the ch student starts to make connections and they see patterns, uh, whether it's between numbers or language, uh, between history concepts or science concepts, they see that you know, there's an interconnection between ideas. And uh, then the third period is the assessment of the child. So the assessment is usually not a test, but uh, having the child give a lesson to somebody else or teach and you would be surprised that even a four-year-old can give a lesson to somebody else. It's not just, you know, those older kids who come down and give lessons. So we've talked about the difference in the view of the child and difference in the view of teacher. But when you walk into a Montessori classroom, it actually looks very, very different from a normal classroom. Um, it is full of this material and it is structured a certain way. So could you talk a little bit about Montessori's philosophy of what a classroom should look like and about Montessori materials, which is, you know, there is so much of Montessori material in the classroom. So what, how, how is that different from a normal school? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the, the very first school that Maria Montessori started in Italy was called Casa de Bambini, which literally means the house of the children or children's house. And, um, her idea is that, you know, education should not be removed from your home or it should be complementary to what you study at home. Because again, education is for, uh, for life. It's not just to go to school, do your math and reading and forget about it, right? When you come home and then throw your books and run around and play or watch TV. So um, when you enter a Montessori classroom, the very first space is the practical life and sensorial space. And that's in children's house, which is the three to six age group, the preschool age, in the elementary age group, and even in the middle school. Things that they are familiar with at home, that they use at home, whether it's um, cooking, whether it's sewing, taking care of plants, uh, taking care of animals. So these are the very first things you notice in the classroom. So everything is very sensorial. You see shapes and you see colors, you see uh, patterns, you see animals, plants, you see a snack area where children can 
cut fruit or vegetables, serve each other, wash the dishes. So that's, um, you know, as soon as you enter that space, you you almost feel you're at home because those are things that we have at our house. And then you transition into the math and the language areas. And um, the idea is that the shelves in the classroom are stocked with materials, but not overly stocked because you want the child to be able to focus on some things. And when it's too crowded, it just creates chaos in the child's mind. So it's very purposefully designed, you know, just uh, one item of everything uh, on the shelves. And then it goes into the history, geography, science areas, art and uh, music areas of, uh, of the curriculum. But the idea that children have a choice to walk through this classroom and choose a material that appeals to them, um, they have the freedom to do that. So in a traditional classroom, you know, you have a language period and you have a math period, you have a science period, and they're predetermined time frames. Well, our mind does not work in predetermined time frames. You know, even as adults, if we start an activity, it takes us a few minutes to kind of set up and get into the flow of the the concept or the thing that you're working on, setting up the tools, the materials you need. And then you work at that concept very intensely and nothing else seems to matter around you. And then you finish the activity, you're satisfied, and then you kind of come down to, uh, to a transition point where you're either hungry or you need to use the bathroom or you need to talk to somebody, uh, take a mental break and then come back. So in Montessori classroom, you see that the, the, there's no bell that really rings. And when the bell actually does ring, it's a very gentle bell with the right tone and everyone stops. And there's silence. Because when the bell rings, it means that something special is going to be announced, whether it's to come to snack or to come to circle or to get ready for a lesson. And um, that's, you know, very gentle. It's um, not the loud bell that rings and everyone is scurrying to go to the next class. It's just a very uh, even flow of activities in the classroom throughout the day. So that's, that's the difference you would see in a traditional and a Montessori classroom. So I wanna get into how you got involved with Montessori schools. So could you kind of bring us up to how you got involved yourself? Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm trained as an architect by profession. So when we first moved to the U.S., um, I decided that I would, you know, stay at home and work with my son. And so we started almost like a homeschool group where we would um, have a group of parents and children who would work together on Montessori concepts. Um, but then, uh, you know, as my son got older, we felt that he really needed to be in school to have a social um, group of his age. And um, that, that was a hard decision for me to say, okay, I'm gonna stop doing architecture, I'm going to move into education. But I think it, at that point, it made perfect sense to kind of follow my child. And that's another concept in Montessori is follow the child. And uh, it was um, his need that, uh, you know, he, he had to be in school. And because we were new to the country, I um, decided that the best thing for me would be to follow him at school. And I started off as an assistant teacher, as a substitute teacher. And then um, the following year, the head of school asked me to take my training and uh, I took my Montessori training and then uh, got involved as a classroom teacher and then a curriculum director and so on and so forth. And now I started my own school. So how did your perception of Montessori change when you were in the side of the teacher and what insights did that give you and how did that lead you to starting your own school? So as a teacher, um, 
you know, a, as a parent at, at home, I could see the results because it was one-on-one -on -one teaching. It was a very small group, right? As a teacher, um, I noticed that all Montessori schools are different. It really depends the, uh, their philosophy, the school's philosophy that, you know, uh, and because there's really Montessori is not standardized as some of the other programs are, uh, there's a lot of variation among schools. And um, the other thing that I noticed was, although Maria Montessori talks about, you know, the child as a scientist, as an artist, uh, the, the focus on STEM was still uh, not there about 15 years ago. And I just felt that since uh, my son was growing up in a digital age, that it's really important to teach how technology works. So I started doing uh, after school classes in robotics and animation, um, later in 3D printing. I started coaching teams in after school for um, creative thinking competitions, uh, for architecture competitions for children. And, um, you know, as my son grew older, he, of course, went ahead to college and things like that. And uh, I had the opportunity to step back again and say, okay, now what? And uh, so four years ago, when my son went to college, I decided that it was time for me to start my own school. And, uh, you know, the Montessori Foundation is really, really crucial and uh, important for children, but it's also important to teach them uh, the technology that exists uh, from, you know, throughout history, not just the digital age. Uh, so, so that's how I ended up starting my school with a focus on STEM. Uh, we call it STEAM because arts uh, are an important part of the curriculum too, uh, with the foundation of Montessori curriculum. What have you learned about your school and changed over time? Um, so our school is four years old. And um, when, you know, this is true with uh, many entrepreneurs that when you start an idea, you know, you have a vision and you uh, experiment with different things that you can try out. Now, we had the gift of the first year we had only four students. So it was again going back to like the homeschool environment. And we had, uh, we have a very innovative uh, team of teachers and a supportive group of parents. So we were able to try out many different things. We collaborated with the robotics lab. We collaborated with um, an arts and craft uh, African drumming group. Um, we uh, are housed near a beautiful art museum. And so uh, the museum uh, allows us to uh, do our art lessons there. So, you know, just the location provided us a lot of opportunities that uh, we wouldn't otherwise have had. So what over the, these course, the, over the course of four years, we've adapted some of these opportunities uh, that exists in our community uh, to our curriculum. But um, at the core, our philosophy hasn't changed or our vision hasn't changed. It's just, uh, you know, we've learned how to streamline the process because when you start out, you know, when a company starts out, you start off with these ideas and then you test those ideas against the market and you say, okay, where is that match? And where is, um, you know, where is your idea? And if you just have a, uh, you know, pie in the sky, that's not gonna work. It also has to serve the need of your, um, of your clients. And so we were able to kind of align that, keeping true to our core philosophy. What does your integration of technology look like? Is there things that were replaced or updated, or are you adding entirely new uh, spaces or stations for children? So, um, you know, the idea of technology uh, in many schools is that, you know, you have a computer lab or you have smart boards and you have this media center. Uh, and really you don't need all of that because throughout history, humans have always tested technology. 
and have made technical advances to create the environment that we are in today. So we really, uh, our program is um, an interdisciplinary program. So the teachers collaborate in uh, the beginning of the school year, they collaborate on the curriculum and integrate science, math, language, history, geography, technology, all together, even music and art. So a few teachers collaborate on uh, some of the concepts. Now, the technology teacher does teach core technology uh, curriculum and ideas like, okay, uh, we do uh, understanding of computers. You know, our children are growing in the digital age. Everything is now just a click away and everything is in the size of their palm. So we open up the computers to kind of say, okay, it went from this huge size and now it's come down to this smaller size. So to show things from the whole and come to the parts. Uh, in the winter, we do electronics and circuits. Um, they uh, learn robotics. They learn how to use Arduino or, you know, solder um, lights and create projects. And then in the uh, spring, we do woodworking. We partner with a maker space uh, near our school and uh, we do woodworking with them. So that's like the basic curriculum. But in the whole school year, technology is interwoven through throughout the curriculum. So one of the things we try to teach children is that technology is not just electronics. And uh, one of the favorite technology STEM project we have is the gingerbread castle competition. And so we um, use the Montessori philosophy of working across age groups. So kindergarten to grade eight, children are divided in groups and the kindergarten uh, garden student has just the same amount of uh, voice that the eighth grader has. And they really work, you know, as mentors and uh, young learners together. They design, they research. So there's a little bit of history involved where they have to research castles, uh, the architecture, the construction, um, you know, evolution of castles. And then um, they design their castle and it could be something from imagination or it could be something real. Uh, this year we had three castles. One was the uh, you know, city of Troy and uh, another was a huge hexagonal pyramid. And um, the third was uh, something from fantasy, a candy making castle. So a castle where candy was made. <laughs> so um, then the science teacher talks about the chemistry behind making uh, the gingerbread dough itself. And we test, you know, if it's too watery, too hard, what happens? And they test out some cookies. Uh, and the children then use their hands and they roll out the dough. The whole school smells just this beautiful aromas wafting through our hallways. And uh, then they actually build the castle and they test and they see how things fail. Uh, but before they actually get to the gingerbread process, they make a paper prototype. And when the paper prototype is to scale um, and, you know, stands uh, strong, then they are ready to you, make it in the gingerbread um, pieces. And then they all get together. And that's the only one time we have candy at our school is, you know, the, the whole school, there are tables full of candy and children can just be kids and take the candy and decorate the castle. And our music director is wonderful. He plays the piano and they're all singing holiday songs and building the castle. And that's our favorite STEM activity at school. So, you know, just to wrap up, uh, technology doesn't just have to be uh, computers and electronics. They can do sewing, they can do woodworking, they can do baking, they can, um, just look around them and everything around us is, was a piece of technology at some point. That's, that's, it feels like I uh, missed my, my opportunity because then when I was a child, I, I would I think I always would have enjoyed an opportunity like that. I would always build models of Stonehenge in preschool and everybody thought I was crazy and yeah. <laughs> I in the wrong classroom. Um, I, I'm interested in why because this approach seems so intuitive to me as how i grew up my parents were both teachers and i always felt 
that 90% of my learning was done at home through basically the Montessori model where I would explore, I would build things with Legos, I would try things new with my parents, I'd go out and help my mom with a garden and learn about how things grew and all these, all these different interactive things. And all of those were things not only did I enjoy doing, but I remembered and retained. And looking back, I could write about how I feel like or what I feel like I learned from that. So with this being such an intuitive approach for me, I'm curious, why do you think that this isn't uh, more widespread? Is there uh, some limiting factor? Is it just institutions resistant to change, resistance to change? Or what, what insight would you have on that? Yeah, um, I've often wondered about this question myself, because it works so well with children. You know, we have students who uh, come from traditional schools with issues of anxiety or uh, lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem, and within a few months, or lack of basic skills of reading, writing, doing the math, and within a few weeks, we see a transformation. And our school is not alone in that. I would say you would see this in many Montessori schools. And so the question is, okay, so why is this method not very popular? Um, one, one of the things is, you know, it's relatively still a new method. It's only about 150 years, um, just over 100 years uh, old. And the traditional system goes back many, many, many centuries, right? Uh, the idea of the teacher standing at the lectern and lecturing everybody, the teacher uh, is the person who has the knowledge and is going to impart the knowledge to others. So that system is so ingrained in our mind that even not just for institutions to change, but even for individual parents to accept that this could be a method that would work for my child is um, difficult. Um, a lot of parents feel, well, I didn't learn like this. And uh, I don't want to be a guinea pig to try it out. So now I feel that in the past 10 years, there's certainly more growth in the Montessori schools. There are many more Montessori schools um, coming up in many areas of the world. And that's because children who have gone through Montessori schools are now adults and are you know, accepting that, hey, this system actually works. So it takes time. I also feel, Alex, like you said, it takes a lot of time for change to happen. And, uh, you know, the way institutions are, uh, they, they almost have an inertia to change because they are so fixed in their methods and their systems of doing things that um, to move such a large uh, establishment takes a lot of effort. So I feel those are the two reasons that it's hard for people to adapt to Montessori. You mentioned uh, something about children being moved to Montessori with issues with anxiety. Um, what, what, what is that basically? Because, for example, I struggled with anxiety as a young child in school, and I felt like I was trying to adhere to these standards that I didn't understand and just made me anxious. And I didn't, it, it didn't click why I had to do 30 math problems in a minute you know, 30 edition problems and, and it would just drive me crazy. And there was no, it was so rigid. There was no exception. There was no um, cultivation of how I learned and it seemed very standard. So who, what types of children and where do you usually see they're coming from come to the school and, and how is the social element different and the, uh, or sorry, not the social element, but that. Um, yeah, I would say the social element is a huge part. Uh, you know, we are social animals. <laughs> and when a school doesn't recognize that, uh, it really fails the child in developing them as a whole child. So uh, I'll start with the first part, you know, why are children anxious? You see, you know, by middle school, children are taking depression medications. Uh, it's so unfortunate to have our children grow up like this. Because, you know, uh, childhood should be full of joy, full of uh, you know, I, I, I look at childhood like a seed full of potential that's just waiting to blossom with the right um, 
environment, the right amount of food and nutrition and sunlight, and they'll be uh, great. But what happens in traditional schools? There are tests, okay? There's this culture of shame. And although teachers will say, oh, you did a fantastic job, or you look great, and your skirt looks beautiful, the child knows that's not true because the child doesn't have internal satisfaction. There's nothing that the child has done herself or himself that says to the child that, look, you know, I have achieved this. And when children don't have that satisfaction, that internal realization that I can do it and that somebody else is doing it for me or somehow I'm not as good as everybody else, uh, then you get these emotions, these negative emotions of fear, anxiety, of feeling left out and um, not fitting in. You know, especially in the middle school age, it's such a crucial age for children to be social. Uh, that's what their brain is looking for. And yet, you know, we put them in this uh, race. And I'm not saying that Montessori children cannot compete. They, they compete very well, but they compete in a very healthy manner because they are assured of who they are. They know who they are. And so, so they don't have to feel anxious. So how do you get there, right? And Alex, you asked about the social component. The social component is a big part of education that I do feel is missing in traditional schools. There's such a race about getting the curriculum done. You know, we have to get this curriculum done for this test. We want to make sure that no child is left behind or whatever you say, right? And in all of that, um, trying to meet the standards and trying to get the numbers, one of the things we do forget is that children are just, you know, looking for connecting with everybody else, uh, for, for trying out things for themselves. The other big part that's missing in traditional schools is the sensory element. And so you see many children now with uh, sensory deficient issues. And you need a weighted blanket or you need this or that, you know, all because they've missed that sensitive period in their lives when they were very young children, three to six years of age, when those sensory, that sensory input was so important for them, for their development. So it's not just that the colors are beautiful and those Montessori materials look cute. There's a purpose for their intellectual, social, and emotional development. It all goes hand in hand. The other part about Montessori, um, why are students not anxious in a Montessori school is because, you know, Montessori teachers look at each child as an individual. And what is the potential this child holds? So you don't have to do 30 math problems in a minute. You don't have to, you know, know everything about um, language or all of your words in your spelling quiz. You'll get there. Not that you shouldn't do it and not that you wouldn't get there, but what makes a particular child tick? Is it their passion about dinosaurs? Is it their passion about art? And so the, the teacher will find the child's passion and then use that as a backdoor entry to teach various subjects. Uh, and so, you know, the children feel very much at home. They feel very, very comfortable and um, they're not anxious. And if, if I have time, I'd like to share a story about a child. Is, is that okay? Of course. Okay. So um, we have this one student. She was, um, you know, extreme. She is very artistic, uh, but she was also very, um, anxious. And the very first thing the teacher would ask her to do is he would say, you know, take 20 minutes and just draw whatever you want. And just those first 20 minutes for her gave her the time to anchor, to set herself and then be prepared for the rest of the day. Uh, and she also resisted math because, you know, she just thought, okay, I'm an artist and what is this math? I, I don't understand that. It's too logical for me. Uh, so when we were studying robotics, um, the technology teacher said, okay, you'll have to know your math facts for programming. And she said, oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to program. I don't want to make the robot. Uh, but that year we were studying Asia and um, we had partnered with a company that was uh, 
making their uh, origami um, robots. And so, uh, you know, she loved art. So origami just spoke to her and uh, she made these beautiful origami animals and birds and flowers and whatnot. And then the teacher said, would you like your butterfly to move and flap its wings? And she was like, of course I want to do that. And he was like, but you'll have to learn, you know, how to program. And she's like, okay, I'll do it because I really want my butterfly to flap its wings. And so she did, you know, and you, robotics doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be, you know, code after code after code that they have to read. It can be brought through art, through other avenues. And so she made... Um, a robot that, you know, she made a butterfly robot and then it also flapped its wings, the flower opened and closed. Um, and the following year, she made two different robots uh, to study, uh, you know, sound, uh, the sonar, uh, and she made a bat and she made a dolphin. And she was so disgusted with just the skeletal pieces of the robot that she so that she made a costume for the bat and she made a costume for her dolphin. And, the, you know, she, she learned programming. She was able to use her art. And she went from being just an artist to becoming an artist and also loving math. So that's, you know, you can, you can really engage a child in many ways uh, at school. Wow, uh, that's amazing, amazing uh, story. So I want to come back to one of the observations because I see a dramatic contrast between this, what you just described, this story, mm -hmm. and the image of the teacher standing on a lecture with all the kids sitting properly on their, you know, work benches and them being lectured to. Um, so it looks like that Montessori's view of knowledge itself is dramatically different than the view of knowledge that is held in school, because it seems like the way in which Montessori ap applies, oh, would you agree with that? The, the, the view of knowledge of a traditional school with the, with the teacher lecturing versus the child exploring with their hands, with their body and with their mind to try to figure things out and do it themselves seems to be a very dramatic, dramatically different view. Yeah, uh, it, it is. It is, you know, it's, uh, there's a stark difference in how a child learns because uh, imagine if you go to a lecture and you're just listening to how to build a birdhouse. And then you actually go to uh, a maker space or you just take pieces of wood and hammer the nails in and you sand the surfaces and then you make a birdhouse. So where is the learning more in which, um, you know, method of learning do you learn how to make a birdhouse? Uh, so yeah, I, I uh, remember, you know, this is not a Montessori child, but I'd walked into a maker space once and there was this five year old girl and she was uh, drawing large dinosaurs. And I said, um, what, what, what are you doing and who are you? And she said, I'm an archeologist and I'm studying dinosaurs. And in that moment, children are in the moment and we have to appreciate that. We, you know, the Montessori teacher has to have the patience and have the curiosity like the child has. You know, whereas if, if you're in a traditional school, okay, you're not going to be an archaeologist right now. Right now we are doing science and everybody open your science books and do this. And, and you know, I think at least in the younger age, there's some freedom in the traditional school. But as you get older, the, the classes, the pressure to do your AP classes or this and that gets so much that you are constricted. And we saw that even with our son, um, as he went into higher grades, that... Uh, that there were these external pressures on him as opposed to him just exploring things on his own. I feel like I got really lucky with some of those things because I ended up going to a music school that was, I knew ahead of time, didn't require focus on my SATs or any of these, you know, grades or ex other metrics. So I was really able to focus on my craft and just the ability for me to do that throughout high school and not have to worry about 
things that I knew wouldn't be 100% relevant to me in my career or in other parts of my life, I feel like that was invaluable, especially at that time. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit to a little bit more of the social interaction between age groups. So mm -hmm. how, how are Montessori classrooms or spaces divided? Are there age ranges? Is it specific age? Um, and how does a teacher or guide uh, guide different age groups through interaction and encourage or cultivate uh, healthy relationships between individuals in the class? Yeah. So Maria Montessori, uh, you know, she was a doctor. And so very first thing she did was when she worked with children, she observed their planes of development. And she noticed that from ages zero to six years, that's the time when the child is trying to learn, you know, to develop their fine motor skills, to develop language, to develop the idea of math, the, you know, just counting, uh, to learn to become a part of their society. They're still, everything is about the child. It's me, me, me. And all the adults are showering their love on this one child, right? So um, naturally, children ages zero to six can be grouped together, but then you can further divide them from zero to three and three to six. And those lines are fairly, um, you know, blurred because a child who is three could be developed in some areas as a four-year-old and could have some delays as maybe a two and a half year old. And so th there's a little blurred line. Similarly, from ages six to 12, so those are the elementary years. Those are the years of laying foundational materials, foundational concepts, grammar, spelling, reading skills, math skills. Um, you know, how do things work? Why do they work? Where did I come from? What is society? Kind of just looking at the big picture. And the big question that Montessori tries to answer during that age group is, who am I? So there are, there's actually a science work called Who Am I? And the children uh, research animals and they find, you know, they play a little game and ask questions and then they ask who am I and the, everybody else has to guess. Uh, they study famous people from history, you know, influential men and women who've shaped how we live today, uh, ancient civilizations. So taking a look at the large uh, picture and saying, how do I fit into society? Because a child from six to 12 years is now able to form ideas, is now able to uh, kind of contribute to what's going on, uh, even in small ways, right? Uh, they can plant a little garden, they can water uh, their tomatoes, and they can set the dishes, they can unload the dishwasher, they can do their laundry or fold the laundry, uh, sort the utensils, things like that. So they can now start becoming part of, the, um, of their home community or their classroom community. And uh, so those children are grouped together in the elementary age group. So some Montessori schools have children ages six to 12 in one grouping, and that's how we started our school too. But then you can also make a finer division within that seven to nine, six to nine, and nine to 12 years of age. And that again, uh, the six to 12 years of age is also the age of justice because children start developing the idea of fairness. What is fair? What's not fair? You'll, you'll often see this young children saying, she got that and he got this and that's not fair and why do I get this? So all of those uh, ideas uh, of justice and fairness are part of that. The next age group is from 13 years to 18 years. And um, that's the time when uh, the analytical brain or the critical brain uh, takes prominence. And you know, how do I become a contributing member of the society? The frontal lobe of the brain is developing at that time. The emotional part of the brain, the amygdala, is swollen and still. So there are, you know, you see this roller coaster of emotions during that time. You don't want to be caught up in that uh, roller coaster, but you want to guide the children through that uh, emotional phase. 
So those children are grouped together. And then of course the final age is uh, when they become adults. And um, my son is in that age group where, you know, they're, they're done with their education and they're out now to uh, participate as contributing members. The, the reason why we had this education for them, right? And uh, many young people between the ages of 18 to 25 are in that age group where they are becoming adults and learning how to take on responsibilities, how to manage their finances. So the, the education at that age is a slightly different. Um, but the whole idea is that it's a mixed age group and children learn from each other. So your question about, you know, how do teachers nurture that? How do guides nurture that interaction? Um, it's, you know, you'll often see in a young classroom, the three to six or the seven to six to nine year old classroom, you'll see children teaching each other how to tie shoelaces. And it's such a simple task, but how many people really know how to tie shoelaces now, right? Everybody is going with the Velcro shoes or slip on shoes. But that's a very fine motor skill that, and it has, you know, uh, first take the two strings, cross them, go under and around, uh, and then make the two loops, cross them over, go around and under. And so they have to remember all of those steps. And so that you'll often see older children trying to help students zip up their jackets, um, tie their shoes, uh, read aloud to the younger children, teach them how to roll a rug. So it's almost like living with siblings or living with cousins in a large family. And um, uh, it's, you know, the idea that uh, I have certain skills and I'm going to share them and the other children in the classroom have other skills and I'm going to be open to learning. And there's no shame if you don't know anything, somebody else is going to teach you that. So um, the, the teachers uh, guide the students you know, we have community meetings right from a very young age and children learn to share their opinion and to wait their turn and listen to other children's opinions and then come to their own conclusion. So uh, it's not about what to think, but how to think. That's, so that's then, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say that's, that's so interesting how different that is from, you know, the traditional education I grew up in grew up in where any inner uh, student talk during almost the majority of the day was prohibited. And if you wanted to turn, turn to your neighbor and ask a question, you'd be yelled at instead of congratulated for finding a solution for not being able to understand what the teacher said. And there was so much built up social energy in all of us that once it was time for recess or lunch, everybody was you know, out of control and everybody would just wait to like wait for those things and be miserable throughout the school day because there were so, so many of these, these rules. And I think it's really, really cool, the natural interaction between different ages and students and without these boundaries of um, kind of like Shrikant would mention the, the rigidity of a teacher lecturing and mm -hmm. in the devaluation of your own and others' opinions or inputs when, you know, I think we all know kids can have some pretty good insights. <laughs> oh, they do. They surely do have good insights. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. You know, uh, we are, I keep telling myself and everybody else, we are social animals. We have to talk. We have to talk to process ideas and what, you know, what's going on around us. So, one of the things that teachers uh, do in Montessori is after a child has solved a problem, a math problem, they'll say, so tell me, how, how did you do this? And uh, the child has to walk through, well, I took the units and there were 10 units, so I exchanged for a 10. And then I counted all the 10s and there were two 10s, the, there were 200, so I carried the 200s to the next place value. And so when you have the child explain the process, you know that the child's understood it. Then you don't have to do, you know, multiple math problems to drill that idea. Of course, you need to know your math facts. And of course, you um, need to, uh, you know, be quick at telling your math facts. But at the same time, you should also know the process behind it. So you mentioned uh, adult Montessori type learning. Mm -hmm. um, 
for those of us who missed Montessori growing up, is there any type of programs or curriculums or ways that we can incorporate Montessori methods into our continuation of our learning? So um, I, I don't know of any programs uh, for continuation of learning, but Montessori uh, training is very transformative. You know, I transformed uh, through my training as I became a Montessori teacher. And uh, so I would say, if anyone is interested, um, take up Montessori's uh, writings, you know, just explore and read them and try to uh, adapt those techniques to your own work environment where you have freedom within limits. That means you have a time frame that you're going to get your work done, but allow yourself to go through that flow of the activity to experience, you know, that gradual increase in focus and concentration and then allow time to transition till you pick up the next activity. There's a lot of focus on discipline. You take something out, you put that away. Um, so that's a very hard thing to do, even for me. Um, but discipline has its place in productivity and efficiency. One of the things that we notice, you know, we take our students to maker spaces, we take them to museums on a daily, weekly basis. Uh, we work with various organizations uh, and our children handle, uh, uh, I would say, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they, they use tools. Um, like saws and drills and things. But the reason these uh, partners allow them to do it is because they know our students know how to handle tools. They know the safety measures. They can depend on the children to behave in a certain manner. Uh, and again, our children are not perfect, but they, ha they have the discipline. They have the grace and courtesy of greeting people, of being gracious and just um, you know kind to one another. So uh, those are basic Montessori tenets that can be practiced at any age level um, with with your organization. And I feel that in organizations we often have like a top down structure, and that perhaps is not necessary. That you can transform your organization to be more Montessori where you look at the potential in each individual that you're working with and nurture that potential. Uh, whereas, you know, just like um, in traditional settings, the idea is to shame if you don't know how to read or whatever. But in Montessori, you say, oh, all right, you know, let's uh, look at dinosaurs and now let's try to read those words. And of course, the child is motivated. So there's always a way to see the talent in a person and nurture that. Um, so for many people, I mean, you know, putting their kid in Montessori school would be great, but sometimes it is not possible. Um, also, in addition to, even if you're sending your kid to Montessori school, way you deal with them at home also matters. So what can parents do to kind of absorb these principles and apply some of the principles at home? Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, Maria Montessori, when she started working with children, her children came from really poor backgrounds and the parents were working day jobs and they didn't have time to uh, do Montessori at home. And so she said, you know, I have these children for so, so much time every day, and I'm going to do what I can do in the school. But as her method evolved, she also wrote about how to uh, parent, how, what's the role of the father, what's the role of the mother, what's the role of grandparents. And um, one of the things she talks about is respecting the child and giving the child limits you know, a lot of times parents want to be their child's best friend and they will get there. They will get there by middle school if in the younger age group, they're given limits. And whether those limits, you know, based on the values that a family holds, those limits could be 
about you know what's accepted what's not accepted what's right what's wrong giving children that understanding of that moral balance between the ages of um, 2 to 13 is very crucial uh, there are many uh, montessori at home books there's one particular book that i like it's by elizabeth hainstock uh, and it's called montessori in the home which um, you know lays very simple things that you can do with a young child at home and now on the internet, there are many resources available um, for parents uh, to set up their, their home environment. So for example, when you know, the schools closed and we had to go on a distance learning platform, uh, the very first thing we did with our parents was to ask them to set up a home environment for the children because the environment plays a huge part in the way children behave. So often parents will say, oh, my child will never do that at home, but he or she does it so willingly at your school. But sometimes it's just looking at the environment. You know, they probably are not able to do certain things at home because the environment is not set up in a way. So giving them an individual space that they are uh, responsible for by giving them, um, you know, a space to think and space to try out experiment with uh, ideas within limits. You don't want them to be so outlandish that they can hurt themselves. Um, the other big part is, um, you know, having family meetings. Their voice is heard and they can add to um, problem solving. You know, adults are not the only people who can solve problems. Children can do them too. And sometimes they come up with brilliant solutions. So giving them, a, you know, empowering children and nurturing their personality as opposed to what parents feel that child should do. You know, sometimes the parents have a certain type of personality and they expect their child to be <laughs> mini me. Um, and often that is not the case. Um, you know, sometimes a parent is very high strung and the child is laid back. And uh, it's, it's important to recognize what your child is like. So you brought up the at-home learning. How has your school changed from the COVID-19 pandemic? And um, are there any changes that you feel like you've learned from or want to incorporate and bring into the future? So um, with the school closures, uh, you know, I've been talking to Shrikant about it and I've been talking to uh, other advisors. We had also started seeing trends from different countries. And so we were prepared when the schools closed. And the day the school closed, uh, our teachers went immediately on to a blended learning platform. And our students were, you know, they did not miss a single day of school during the closures. Um, our distance learning platform is based on our core philosophy of hands-on learning and um, project-based learning. So uh, we, you know, uh, the teachers uh, met over the weekend to plan the curriculum for the extended time that the schools were closed and changed their lesson plans to kind of adapt to the online platform. And um, the, so the first week was the week of transition. So we looked at uh, the weeks as, you know, each week was a month. So the first week was like September. We had to reset everything. We had to transition to a new platform. So the first week was getting children used to feeling comfortable at home for learning and uh, creating a space for themselves, learning to do some of the chores at home. So those became the practical life activities. Uh, creating a space in the refrigerator so that they could reach for the younger children so they could reach their snacks and drinks independently and didn't have to interrupt the parents because during this time the parents were still working and so we wanted to make sure that the children were as independent as possible in that situation. Um, learning to take care of themselves so care of self is a big part of the Montessori curriculum and so uh, dressing, cleaning, um, you know, taking care of their clothes, uh, taking care of their pets, 
So all of that um, were some of the exercises that we included in our lessons. And uh, poetry was a big part because poetry, you know, has a way of bringing great ideas in a very concise manner. And uh, so our teachers, especially our upper elementary, the uh, fourth to sixth grade and the middle school teachers started the uh, online lessons with poems, poems about bonding, poems about caring, poems about relationships between father and child, um, between uh, a dog and its owner. So kind of just talking about relationships and how things have changed for us. So having those conversations helped the students transition to the online platform and it wasn't abrupt. The next week was almost like October and November where we were ramping up for, you know, learning new platforms. So whether it was learning Zoom, Khan Academy, typing program, because we really don't have a lot of computers in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis because everything is hands-on. And so now we had to teach them to type because the skill of penmanship wasn't going to be helpful during um, the the pandemic. So uh, we had to teach them typing. So we, uh, you know, started doing that. Um, and the children were all excited because, you know, they had something new to, uh, to, to look at and try out. And very soon they surpassed all the teachers. We were still learning different features on those platforms and the children could come back and teach us how to do those uh, things. So it was a very nice interaction. Uh, giving children a schedule and a work plan was helpful. So they had a schedule from 8.30 to 3.30. The teachers met with them three times a day. There was a morning lesson, a midday check-in, and the end of the day. We also met as, an, as a whole school assembly uh, every week on Mondays and Fridays. So that kept the community together. The children love to see each other. And every time I asked them during the assembly, what do you miss about school? They were like, oh, I miss meeting my friends. I miss hugging my friends. I miss seeing my teachers. And they never once said we're missing the English lesson or the math lesson. <laughs> um, so we tried to do a lot of community meetings. We had play dates after school on Zoom and children got together to just play. They talked about silly things and fairies. Um, so that was another nice thing to keep the... And in the evenings we had... Uh, open uh, discussions for parents with me so that parents could stay connected too. You know, parents uh, feel a little isolated during this time, especially they were stuck at home with the children. Uh, they had to do their work and uh, also they couldn't go out. So we had uh, parent meetings. And um, we had a poetry recital as a community event. So every year in the spring, uh, we have poetry recital and spring tea. And so all of our students memorized their poems, dressed up. We had an actor from New York. He's been coming to our school for past four years and coaching our students. So he did that over Zoom. And, uh, you know, the children love to memorize their poems. They sang their poems. And all the families gathered around their computer screens they were all dressed in their Sunday best and they all had a spread of beautiful tea and cookies and, you know, scones, uh, flowers. And we had a beautiful virtual poetry recital. And then um, we got into, you know, the months of January, February um, equivalent in, uh, you know, the sixth, seventh, eighth week of the school closures. Those are the times, you know, January through March are the real times when children get into this work mode um, because they've gathered all the basic lessons and skills and now they're able to apply them. And we could see that uh, whether they were doing presentations, whether they were doing research or um, uh, hands-on projects in science, um, history studies, they were able to participate um, more collaboratively during that time. And then we ended the year with a puppet show because uh, we couldn't go to the art museum as we do for art lessons. So we had a puppeteer who worked with our students. And you know, in this whole chaos of the closures, children had lost control over their basic routines, their basic things that they were familiar with. But the puppets gave them something to imagine, something to control. 
And um, this year uh, we were studying uh, North America and they were able to create a whole puppet show about North America and uh, stories from North America, songs from North America. And some of our students uh, also 3D printed parts of their puppets. So they were able to integrate technology and some of them sewed their puppets, some made miniature dioramas. Uh, so it was very beautiful. So I would say, you know, for most students it worked, but for some parents and students it did not work as well. Uh, and partly because, you know, it requires a lot of time management and organization skills and children are still learning those skills. So, um, so we, we have to think a little bit about that if we have to do it again. Uh, and then we also learned that there are so many wonderful um, technology outlets out there that we were not using because we were so focused on hands-on Montessori materials. And being a technology school, we um, you know, thought that, hey, we should be using these ideas or these uh, applications on a day-to-day -day basis. So to your question, Alex, when we go back, I think it's going to be a more mix of the two platforms because uh, we are not going back to the old ways of doing things. It's certainly going to look different in the fall and we will be at school uh, unless uh, we are told otherwise by the governor. Uh, but uh, I think what's going to happen is with all the physical distancing and um, hygiene protocols, we are going to bring in some of these uh, technology applications that distance learning applications that children can learn. Because the other thing that, you know, our teachers were not just from our geographical areas. We had teachers from New York, New Jersey, or we even collaborated with a school in Australia and became pen pals because they were going through the same thing and we were going through the same thing. And all we had to do was get on Zoom and talk to each other. So the other thing we learned is we are not bound by geography at all. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so uh, I think there are many ways we can integrate technology uh, when we go back in the fall. Yeah, that's amazing. So if somebody is a parent or future parent and is interested in having their kid attend a Montessori school, how do you find one and how do you decide if it's the right fit for your child? Yeah, that, so that's actually uh, when when parents come to um, see our school, we do uh, have an interview process. And, um, you know, going back to what we said before, uh, the Montessori system works for almost all children, but it doesn't work for all parents. And that's because adults have these preconceived notions of what education should look like. And some parents may be looking for all bells and whistles, you know, of, uh, private school, or they may be looking for a rigorous um, curriculum, or they may be looking for a very um, strict format, whatever it is, whatever perceptions they come with, there has to be some alignment and some common goal uh, for them. So um, we, we spend about 12 to 15 hours with each prospective family before they enroll their child. So we meet with them, uh, they tour the school, we talk to them about our philosophy. Uh, we learn about their family and what their hopes and dreams are for their child. Uh, then we invite the child for an interview or to spend a morning with our students and they get to see how the school works uh, and the teachers get to know them uh, and that gives us another opportunity to talk to the parents and see if it's still a good fit for their child. And, um, you know, we've had parents who were very skeptical when they first came. And then within a month, they were very thrilled to see, okay, this is actually working. And we've also had parents who uh, thought that it would be a good fit, but they, they uh, were looking for something else. And the school wasn't a right match. So, you know, we hope that by spending enough time getting to know the family, we can find the right fit uh, for the child. Yeah, that seems like a great idea. Um, so I want to start, uh, I want to be mindful of your time and, and our audience. So 
Is there any last thing, Shurkan or Rupali, that you'd like to add before we move on to our next segment? Nothing here, uh, Sir Rupali. Uh, I'll just uh, share a story about a very young child and, you know, the whole idea about what an abstract, the, the thing that I forgot to tell is that Montessori is about bringing abstract ideas into concrete form, which is why it works for children. And so this past Martin Luther King Day, we were talking about why we observe Martin Luther King Day and you know, the, there were some eighth graders who stood up in our school assembly and talked about their experiences. Uh, we talked about the historical significance. We talked about Gettysburg Address and so on and so forth. And at the end of the assembly, I asked every child, why do you like to be in a free country? And so student after student, as they were being dismissed, they said, oh, I like to be in the free country because I have the freedom to speak or I have the freedom to write about whatever I want to. And, you know, they all talked about why the freedom meant so much. And then I came to this youngest child in our school. He's a kindergarten student, five years old. And I said, why do you like to be in this free country? And he looked up at me with his big, bright eyes and said, I like to be in this free country, but my mom and dad always say no to me. And so <laughs> the whole idea, you know, this whole concept of freedom is so abstract, but to a five-year-old, it, it's a very, you know, hard concept to uh, understand. So I think Montessori does a good job of giving them a lot of opportunities to experiment with these ideas um, as they grow up. Thank you for that. That's, that's, that's a good story. <laughs> So at this point, uh, at this point, I want to move on to our section we call the off topic. And this is a place for anybody who's new here that our guest brings up a topic that's unrelated to the main one, whether it's a book recommendation, a charity they'd like to pitch or a rant they want to go on about somebody that was mean in line at uh, the grocery store earlier. Rupali, what do you have for us? Um. I'm sorry, can you say, I was reading the questions and uh, I got distracted. You were saying about the grocery line and somebody being mean to. Oh yeah, if, no, just if, if you had a story, you know, and you wanted your off topic to be uh, ranting, you know, about some, some person that ruined your day, that's a totally valid off topic as well. So I'm going to give you the floor, whatever you want to bring up, go ahead. Um. So I will say that uh, in, uh, in my past life <laughs> before Montessori, I would be really upset and I had a very short fuse when people would you know, do something that to me seemed irrational. Uh, but over this uh, course of 20 years as a Montessori educator, you know, Montessori has its very transformative way and you don't realize it as you're going through the training, but as you go, th you know, practice those principles day in and day out, you uh, st stop and think and say, okay, what's going on in this other person's life? And why is this person behaving in the way they are? So uh, sometimes I, I, whether I'm driving um, on the road or uh, like you said, in the grocery line, <laughs> Uh, there have been moments where uh, I have been irked by people's behavior. And, you know, my first reaction is to um, kind of say something or do something about it. But then the Montessori voice in my head says, okay, stop and think. And so this whole acronym that we are taught about stop, which is literally stop, take a moment, observe, and then proceed. So... <laughs> That's what we use in the Montessori classroom, and it, it's uh, helping me become more aware. Oh, that's great. I think <laughs> a lot of us could use that type of uh, training. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, we're going to move into audience questions. So since I don't know how to work the Zoom stuff as well as your Kant, I'm going to turn it over to him. And so if you have questions, throw them in the chat, and we'll uh, Shurkant will unmute you so you can ask or you can ask him to ask it for you. So Rupali, thank you for this main part and we appreciate you being here. 
You're welcome. I thoroughly enjoyed it and thank you for having me. Of course. Wonderful. Uh, again, thank you, Rupali. And now it's time for questions. What we're going to do is we're going to take about three questions now and then do breakout rooms. And then we're going to come back um, with our takeaways. So we get to kind of discuss everything and then we'll do kind of more considered questions for Rupali. So the three questions uh, are going to be uh, Joe, Jean, and Sanjay. Please try to keep your questions short uh, so Rupali can you know, address them fully. Joe, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I have about 10 different questions I could ask, but I really uh, appreciated your presentation. But the one I'm gonna go with is that as a kid, I would often become hyper-focused and so how would you balance a kid's passion with variety and learning if there's someone that comes into the classroom and they're really, you know, focusing on one particular area of learning and so that they can become actually more well-rounded or still ensure they become more well-rounded because this is something that is actually carried into my adult life as well. So if you can answer that, you know, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so, you know, um, when you want someone to become really good at something, you want them to be hyper-focused, right? And so being hyper-focused is actually a very good skill or a good quality to have because then you can tune out what you don't want to, know, to hear and really focus on something, provided that it is productive. If it is not productive and is getting in the way of doing things, uh, and because you're so hyper-focused on art that you don't want to do math, that's not going to help you in life. And so uh, the Montessori guide will often, you know, there's uh, something as a work plan that we use in the classroom. So the children are expected to do their reading, writing, math, history, geography uh, assignments. When they do it is their choice, but they have to do it. The choice is not not to do it. So... Um, Teachers take time to coach students about, you know, managing their time, uh, organizing their activities within the class time that they have. And so these soft skills of, you know, whether you're collaborating with somebody else. And so if you're collaborating with another person, then you have to make the time to do that research project that you told them you would do or to write the story that you were going to write with them. Um, it's just respectful to do it. And uh, that other person is waiting for you. So uh, you can't just stay focused on your activity and not be uh, doing that. So by actually talking to the students, the teachers will guide them. Uh, and, you know, often we have students who only want to uh, come in and the very first thing they want to do is take out a book and read, or they want to just do their penmanship practice. And they would spend their whole day if they want writing stories. Uh, so there's, there's a good element to that, but then uh, we always talk about um, a balance. And one of the core values of, of our school is balance. And uh, our upper elementary teacher, he talks about balance as, you know, the symbol yin and yang, that it's a curved line. It's not always a straight line. So you can do a little more of this but then you have to do a little bit of that. And so by giving them that, uh, that uh, image and by uh, bringing it to them in concrete ways, you know, you can have a child learn how to balance their work and their playtime or the activities that they're doing. And uh, Alex, something you had said before is how can we bring Montessori to our adult life? I think here's one example is how do you balance your day-to-day -day activities and uh, your, your various hats that you wear, right, as an adult. Thank you, Rupali. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask Joe whether that um, made sense to him. Yes, it does. Yeah, I know it, there's a natural balance that can be achieved where you're, you know, yes, hyper-focused is good, but again, at a certain point, it becomes unhealthy, and it yes. seems like you have a way of uh, determining that. And I, and I think that, yeah, if hyper-focused within a context of a project with other kids 
is maybe a natural way of balancing that because everybody's not going to be hyper-focused. So it would also be a, a good way of working in integrated teams. So that's, that's, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Next one up is Jean. Jean, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, I think I'm very lucky to join this uh, lecture because I just uh, interviewed at Montessori School locally for my son who's 12 years old and I'm planning to send him this coming fall. And um, so I, I have actually uh, struggled a lot to make the decision mm -hmm. and uh, because my son, he's very smart and he has a lot of struggle at school because he get bored and the, he's an experiential learner and the school just like doesn't work for him. So, so I, and I also read a lot of books. I realized he may have ADD. And uh, I read the book uh, mentioned about the hunters in the farmer's world and they mentioned the private school actually will work for those kids, have no problem. So that's why I started to look at the private school and I interviewed this 12 acre land school with a llama and the gardening. I thought this is perfect for him. And today, listening to your lecture make me feel more confident about this decision. I think I look at the review of the teacher like, so it's just like, is, you know, even I, you know, I, I spent so much money to go into the school district, supposed to be best school district in the area. And now I'm going to pay extra money to drive additional two uh, hour each day. But I think it's really worth it. You know, kids are different. Our school system is only foster one type of kids. Like they have to be same standard kind of kids, not working for everybody. And as some as some of parents, we have to do actual work to make make it work. And I appreciate all you guys help to make it happen. You know, I want to ask is like for sixth grade, is that a little bit late for them to get into the the system? Well, uh, thank you, Jean. Uh, and I am very glad that you went to the Montessori school and that you are exploring that as an option for your 12 year old. Uh, so one of the things that people say to uh, us when they come to our school and they'll say, you know, educators also come to observe the school and they say, oh, this is very nice because you have all normal kids and you don't have any children with attention issues or behavior issues. And we have to say, no, we have all those students. We, you know, children are children. Um, around the world, right? They are the same. Mm -hmm. they, some children are going to misbehave because one of their needs is not met or some of their needs are, is not met. And then that's why they're misbehaving. Uh, if they have attention issues, that's because the environment is not right. Uh, that the, the environment is distracting or is not engaging. And they're mm -hmm. seeking, they're looking for something. And when they find something that satisfies them, uh, you know, then their brain feels satisfied, right? So uh, there's a chemical, um, there's a chemistry happening in the brain, uh, which releases, you know, those, uh, I think it's dopamine, if I'm not mistaken, but when, when they feel that they've achieved whatever they were looking for, then they feel satisfied, and then they're not hyperactive. So um, every, as I said, every Montessori school is different. So you should certainly ask them about their philosophy and how they engage all, ch all kinds of learners. Uh, but the, the point about um, having, you know, hands-on materials for especially children with attention um, issues is by giving them something to hold, to touch, to feel, it also slows them down. And that process of slowing down is also helpful for children. Uh, so uh, probably this uh, it might be a good, good place. I don't know, but you should definitely uh, take a look. Okay, I'm going to put you two in the same breakout room so you can talk a little bit further about this. Sure. Um, sure. So the uh, next one up, the, so we're going to have one last question from Sanjay, and then we're going to do breakout rooms for exactly 25 minutes, and then we'll come back and share our takeaways from this. Sanjay, go ahead. Okay, um, so first I just want to say I absolutely love the example you gave um, STEM example of the gingerbread house. Um, I think that that was a wonderful way to teach children about, uh, you know, simple elements of architecture, of design, physics, chemistry, um, you know, a very, very, very nice example. Um, I also Thank sent you. my children to Montessori um, at the beginning when they were younger. 
Um, now, one thing that I noticed was that you described um, the little girl who had, who was very artistic, but she had learned to believe that she could not learn mathematics. Yes. And that's, that's something that I, I also have, have seen in a lot of children, including my own, where they learn um, either through their parents, they learn through society or, or from their own peers, especially during their teen years. So I think that, um, and, and what I saw was that um, especially girls also learned to believe that they could not learn mathematics or sciences or areas of computing, things like that. Uh, so this applies not only to children, though. I, I think it also applies to adults because the same thing happens with adults. The peer groups that we are in um, and the people that we um, surround ourselves with can have these types of influences. So the, the question I have is, how do, we, how do you suggest we, we change this in society or we publicize the society that um, parents don't, don't do this to children and other adults, that they don't pass on their own limited thinking to others? Well, that's a loaded question there. Uh, you know, these stereotyping uh, girls and boys activities, I think for many cultures, it's ingrained in how people conduct themselves at home. And um, I remember we had a student, uh, he was two, two, three years old, almost three years old. And he was just unable to control or regulate his uh, emotions. And one of the things we had him do was cook. And by baking bread every day, he just loved to knead and to, to bake the bread and smell the aroma as the bread started to bake. Uh, and he would calm down. And uh, I was so thrilled about this thing that was actually working for this boy. And the mother came to me and she said, we don't do that at our house. Boys don't cook. And I was just so taken aback, you know, that these are small things that we establish in our children's minds from a very young age when they don't even know uh, how to make sense of things around them, but they hear messages that girls can do this and boys can do that. And, you know, we are all humans and um, everyone is capable of doing what they set their mind to do. Uh, and uh, by knowing themselves. So I think the first thing is to uh, look inwards and see what our values are and what our capabilities are, uh, and then whether we can uh, train ourselves to get to the point that we hope to get to. Uh, so I think as for children, it's important to break those barriers, uh, whether at home or at school or while doing activities um, with children at a young age to be careful about what we are saying. Uh, I, I, I don't know if this uh, helps. Sanjay, what do you think? Thank you. No, I'll, I'll, I'll also put Sanjay in the same room as you so you okay. can continue because obviously <laughs> sure. there is a lot, lot to talk about there. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, Alex, do you have any uh, final uh, kind of comments or anything? Let me hand it over, over to you and then we'll do the breakout rooms. Go ahead, no. Alex. I think that was fantastic. Thank you, Rupali, again. And Thank I you. think a really promising area of education. And it's it's funny to think that 100 years old is so recent, but it, it really is in terms of yes. relationships to other, other, you know, longer running things. So I'm definitely uh, sold. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, thankful that you were able to be here and be able to learn about this. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thank you, Rupali.